Good morning and uh, welcome to everybody. And I know that there are new people on and praise God, they've heard Val in the Lake District. They've heard um, a, a flame team in Trowbridge last week and we've got new people coming. So we're absolutely delighted about that. What we want to do is for you to have an amazing time on the fireside. And I'll just pray if that's okay before Val speaks to us. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would bind down anything of death and hell, Antichrist and Jezebel that doesn't uh, in the name of Jesus. And we put the blood of Jesus between these kingdoms of Satan and forbid the enemy from operating during this session. But we and we cover all of us with the blood of Jesus and we invite the Holy Spirit to wherever we all are, whether it's in a bedroom, a lounge, a kitchen, a, 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 um, a conservatory, the garden, the pub, wherever we are, I pray that the Holy Spirit would dwell in there. And we would today get revelation direct from the Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Val, over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jan. And uh, hi, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, well, yes, uh, Edgar and I, plus uh, um, a team of a full team of seven, just returned from South Sudan on um, on Wednesday, and uh, that was our first time back since the pandemic. And what a what a joy it was. We went to a place called Wow, which is in the um, center up towards the northern end um, of uh, South Sudan. So. Um, and uh, while John was mentioning the forge, I, I will say that we had three uh, members of the team who have completed forge one and forge two, and it's always a joy to see them coming on mission and playing a full part, teaching, ministering, um, leading ministry uh, small groups, um, and and that's uh, and far far more confidence in uh, in being on a, a flame mission. So I would uh, I would recommend both coming on mission, but also uh, coming on the forge. We had um, uh, two weeks uh, up in uh, Wow, a place I was there before in uh, January 2020. We had a wonderful time with five division uh, chaplains and soldiers. We had uh, 53 of them and um, in the barracks, we went and traveled to the barracks each day um, and we just saw the Lord uh, bringing healing. You could see their faces lift and their eyes shining as the days uh, went by, but it was uh, a great joy to be working with them. We then ran a pastors and leaders conference uh, in the diocese of Wow, um, and that uh, that was five days. And again, we had uh, just over fifty pastors and leaders with us, um, and we uh, we did the teaching and then went into small groups. and And again, we were watching the Lord. Um, at work in them. We were there for two Sundays, so that uh, gave us the joy of going out to churches, different churches on uh, uh, and, and preaching on forgiveness mainly, but other subjects as well. And our final uh, thing was um, a day of a half day of outreach when we just opened up the cathedral and said anybody who wants to come, uh, come. And the joy of that uh, particular uh, time was that um, people who we'd trained earlier uh, were there as the ministry team. We as a team hardly did any praying. We watched as, um, as the, the uh, South Sudanese ministry team uh, prayed for the people who, who were there. We saw God just bringing in a healing and people were sleeping soundly that had never slept soundly before. Families were being reunited um, after some time of separation and broken relationships. They were coming back and, and uh, telling us that brothers or sisters had, had rung up and said they were coming to see them. And that's really important in a very family orientated culture. Uh, we saw um, healing of family members, children and husbands being healed whilst they were at home and their wives, their spouses uh, with us in the conference. And that's the power of forgiveness. That's the power uh, of God at, at work. And um, 
it, it was so exciting. Every day uh, there was something new that the Lord was doing and a great excitement to us um, as a team. So, um, yeah, if the Lord's been speaking to you while I've been speaking, that uh, mission is something that you would like to do, then just get in touch with us. We'd love to see you. Thanks, uh, John. Thank you, Val. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, and South Sudan is very exciting, she says. And, and so that's great. But so now I just like to invite Edgar, who was on the last forge and has just been out to South Sudan with Val, but he's got a different subject this morning. And we pray um, anointing on you, my brother, as you speak this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, those who do not know me, my name is Edgar Rich. I live in Camberley. Uh, literally five minutes walk from St. Paul's uh, Church, where I received the training of Forge 1 and 2. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you on persecution, um, which I know Colin will cover in more depth in his talk. Um, so what I'm just going to outline is, is, is a flavor of uh, what is to come in Colin's talk. Did you know that persecution of Christians has continued to increase from the day Christianity came into existence? Every year it is worse than the previous year for the last 2000 years. It's incredible to actually think if you just digest this fact that every year Christian persecution is on the increase. This year is worse than it was last year. Next year is going to be worse than this year. It's quite alarming, actually, when you look at it that way. There's a gentleman who lives in Cornwall. His name is uh, Russell Blacker, Dr. Russell Blacker. He's a psychologist. Uh, he is committed uh, to fighting this, uh, this terrible act. He regularly produces a, a report on persecution right across the world. And he lobbies government and, and tries to get them to act a bit more be more active in, in, in trying to help um, people who are persecuted, especially Christians. Um, I can forward that report to anyone who's interested. Uh, you can get my details from uh, Karen or, or, or Jan, and I can forward this report to you, and you can then contact him directly and ask him to send you the report uh, to you directly. I must warn you, it, is, it makes uh, pretty unpleasant reading though. Um, so over the last 12 years, my wife Gail and I have been serving as missionaries in Turkey or among refugees who have fled from Iran because of persecution. Uh, because quite simply because they've given their lives to Jesus and have renounced Islam. We have actually seen the scars on their backs and chests of young men young enough to be our grandchildren. Uh, these people have lost everything, their country, their people, families, jobs, homes, friends, community, everything. Their only possession is the clothes on their backs. Um, it, it's heartbreaking. Um, when they come to Turkey, they have no rights of any kind. They have no voice. They don't have a visa to work. They work on the black market and they're taken advantage of. Uh, quite often they will work for a whole month and will at the end of the month, the employer will say, I cannot pay you because I've had a bad month. Go away. And they can do nothing about it. Sometimes it's hard to believe that, this, that in this day and age, this is happening, that humans can treat each other in such an inhumane way. And John, Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, verse 20, remember the word I spoke to you. If they persecute me, they will persecute you also. And Paul said to Timothy in his letter in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So when we compare our lives in Britain to those, uh, to those two statements that I've just read uh, from Jesus and Paul. 
do we actually struggle to see the truth in them? Or were Jesus and Paul exaggerating? Where is the persecution? Has anyone been flogged, stoned, been beaten with fists and wooden clubs, cursed and spat upon for sharing the gospel in Britain? Or anywhere else in the West, as a matter of fact? See, Gail and I have been doing outreach for a number of years. <clears throat> Admittedly, we don't, you know, stand in the streets with a loudspeaker and condemn everyone who's walking by saying, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to go to hell. We don't do that. What we tend to do is give out tracts. And quite often people actually take the tracts from us and some even stop and read them and we end up having discussions with them. But to, to date, both Gail and I have had no trouble at all in the streets sharing the gospel. Um, it's in a much more uh, less confrontational style and it works. So really, you know, we have not seen any kind of persecution that we have seen in the Bible. That Paul suffered and, and our Lord in the end, he went to the cross. If we struggle to see the truth in the two statements I mentioned just now, it is because we usually see persecution as physical cruelty, beatings, torture, imprisonment, even death of individuals. But Christian persecution in the West can come in very subtle forms, such as loss of employment, being overlooked for promotion, ridicule, harassment, loss of friends and family, as well as threats of physical violence, but which are rarely carried out. The enemy operates very differently in the West when compared to the Middle East or the Far East. In the Middle East and Far East and Africa, it is physical violence, including death, but in the West, it is psychological. Both attacks are spiritual, but one manifests itself in physical violence, even death, but the other in fear. The main weapon used by the enemy in the West is fear. Yeah. Fear of violence, rejection, ridicule, unemployment, loss of friends, poverty, death, loss of status, and so on and so on. In the West, the enemy usually declares war in the minds of Christians, not in the body. Sadly, Western society has never been more fearful than it is today. The proof of this statement can be found in trying to get an appointment with a counselor at short notice. You will be kept waiting for at least a fortnight because of their packed diaries. So why? Are some Christians fearful? It could be lack of faith and trust in God, that God will let them down when they need him most. Lack of faith and trust in the word of God and the promises of God. Or believing that the word of God was meant for another time, place, and people. God's word does not apply to them now living in the 21st century in the West. This kind of thinking could possibly result in a misguided belief that if they kept their head down and maintained a low profile in church, the enemy would leave them alone. They don't realize that the moment they declared their faith and allegiance of Jesus, they became a target for the enemy. But the Lord Jesus did not leave us unprotected. In John 14, he says to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. Just before ascending into heaven, he said that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him, which he has passed on to us. We have all the authority and power with which we can battle the enemy. Jesus said to his disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. He has also given us the Holy Spirit to guide us, encourage us, teach us, and empower us. We also have the word of God reassuring us of his promises and protection. Finally, we have prayer. 
Prayer is not such, prayer is not just a means of letting God know of our wants and needs. Prayer is also a divine weapon to be used against the enemy. When we pray to God, it gives God the freedom to act on our behalf. God will not act in our lives until and unless we pray and ask him to. When we command the enemy with all the faith, power, and authority we have to go away in the name of Jesus, he has no choice but to flee from us. We have nothing to fear from the enemy. As children of God, when we face challenges, we must not think of ourselves as victims. We are conquerors. We are overcomers. Through the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross, we are victors and not victims. We have the power and authority not only to repel, but to defeat the enemy every time. Now, how does this actually work in practical terms? The enemy can be very subtle. Now, just to give you an example, have you ever had the experience of waking up in the morning? There's absolutely nothing wrong in your life. Everything is perfect, but you wake up in a foul mood and you cannot seem to have a decent conversation with anyone. And you're looking, almost looking for a fight an argument uh, with someone. This is a clear sign that the enemy is having a pop at you. Now, it's, this is the ability to recognize the signs and deal with it immediately, not put it off saying, you know, oh, I'm too busy right now, I'll deal with it later. Deal with it there and then. We have the power and the authority to tell the enemy where to go. And we exercise that power. You could be walking down an aisle in a supermarket doing your weekly shopping, and you can deal with it. Just command the enemy to go away in the name of Jesus and ask the Lord to fill you with his Holy Spirit and to give you peace and love to overtake you and fill you, fill you to overflowing. And then confess, repent, and ask for forgiveness. Ask the Lord to forgive you for allowing the enemy to get into you to such an extent that he has actually disturbed your peace and your harmony in your mind and your spirit. It's as simple as that. There is nothing more to it. It is straightforward. But the truth is you must be able to recognize when the enemy is having um, a pop at you is to completely stop doing what you're doing, deal with the situation there and then, and ask the Lord to come in and fill you and to ask the Lord to, for your, uh, to confess and to repent and to ask him to forgive you for what has actually happened. That's it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. That was great. Um, and now may I, May I ask uh, Colin to come? I've spoken about him and uh, he's, he's part of the Flame family, as I said. So Colin, uh, you've been prepared to take this challenge on and I'm so grateful. And uh, we look forward to what you have to say. May I just say at the end of Colin's talk, we will not be going into breakout groups. But Colin is prepared to answer questions, brave man. And uh, so if you have any questions, um, we will tell you how to ask the questions um, at the end of his talk. So thank you, Colin. And we pray uh, the same as I did for Edgar, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit and for you to speak into our spirits in order uh, that we get revelation about this whole situation in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Jan. And um, welcome to this session. This is the third session in a series on the end times. And today we're looking at the Antichrist and at the topic of persecution. I'm just going to share my screen. I hope this will be helpful for, um, for some of you as we go.
Okay. So yes, the topic of the Antichrist. Um, Antichrist uh, is a figure who will rise to prominence on the world stage immediately before Jesus returns. So today we're really getting into the last events before the return of Jesus. Uh, in, in a way, his, his, uh, his appearance is the final sign. He tells us Jesus' return is imminent. As a figure, he sort of brings to a climax humanity's rebellion against God and against Jesus, but also Satan's opposition to God and to his people on the earth. So the rise of the Antichrist is going to usher in a short period of persecution of both Christians and Jews, which will be something that hasn't been seen before. And if you think about the history so far, that's quite a statement. But we have to say at the start that when Jesus returns, the Antichrist will be utterly defeated. There's going to be no contest when Jesus comes back. Edgar has already talked uh, about persecution and actually quoted these verses in John 15. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also, is what Jesus said. And um, persecution, as Edgar said, has been a theme of uh, church history ever since the book of Acts. And it's a real reality in the life of the global church today. So the organization Open Doors estimates that uh, about 360 million Christians, that's one in seven of the uh, Christians in the world today, lives in a state uh, where there is uh, considerable persecution or discrimination against Christians. So our brothers and sisters around the world are very much experiencing what we're talking about uh, already. Um, persecution is also a, a, a uh, a real theme of the uh, biblical writing on the end times. So we will look at a few scriptures on that in a couple of minutes. But what we're going to see is that the gospel advances in the midst of this persecution. Uh, and I'd like to suggest that one that part of our preparation as living as Christians for Jesus in our day, even in the UK, is to come to terms with the reality of persecution. Here are some verses from Revelation 13 which tell people how to respond when the Antichrist arises. Now unlike quite a few people in flame, I have no military background. Actually I have, um, I hate the thought of violence and the sight of violence, but when I think about persecution I think there is, we have two possible responses to it. Um, one is fear, which Edgar has already talked about, and the other is acceptance, which is essentially what these verses are talking about. Fear causes me to shrink back so as not to get hurt, but the consequences of that is that I'm not fully available for what God wants me to do. By contrast, acceptance doesn't mean that I will be persecuted but it, or suffer, but it does mean that I accept that my life is in God's hands and I choose to trust him with it. If, well, I know that Jesus is capable of protecting me at all times, so if he sees fit that I should suffer for him, he has his good reasons for it. When Flame teaches on the Lordship of Christ, uh, it finished, the teaching finishes with a prayer, and I find there's one line in that prayer which is very challenging. It says, Lord, I submit to you the manner and timing of my death. And I don't know whether you can say that with me this morning, but Lord, I submit to you the manner and timing of my death. And as we start this talk, I'd like to say if anything in what I say causes Fear to arise in you, I encourage you uh, to resist that fear and just trust that your life is in God's hands. This series uh, on the end times is anchored in two parts of the New Testament. One is 
Jesus's uh, discussion of the end times in Matthew 24, and the other is the book of Revelation. So let's just quickly look at what uh, these two parts of scripture say about persecution. So here's Matthew, uh, a section of Matthew 24. I want you to remember that the um, context is when uh, Jesus' disciples say, what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus talks about various signs and then gets on to the reality of persecution for his followers. I understand this passage is talking about the whole period between Jesus's ascension and his return. And I've highlighted the phrase all nations, which appears twice in these verses. You will be hated by all nations because of me, but this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. The gospel advances to all nations in the midst of persecution when all nations are hating Jesus' followers. Before the gospel comes to a new nation or people group, the kingdom of darkness is unchallenged. And when the gospel comes, Satan will not let his people go without a fight. Note that the persecution spoken of here is serious, uh, it talks of people being put to death. It talks of many turning away from the faith. It talks of betrayal, of the love of many growing cold, presumably to avoid reprisals and avoid persecution. It also talks of false prophets arising. And I have a sense that in this passage, one of the key messages of the false prophets is you can be a follower of Jesus and avoid persecution. If only you become a little bit more like the world around you when we lose our salt and our effectiveness. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Hallelujah. As I was preparing this talk, it also struck me that these verses give us insights into what it means to stand firm through persecution. So it means not turning away from my faith when I'm under pressure not betraying my brother or sister, not allowing my love for Jesus to grow cold as a way of avoiding unwanted attention. Is it okay to flee persecution? Yes, it is. Though God may also call us to remain somewhere that is dangerous. If we think of Paul's example, sometimes he accepted mistreatment when he could have got out of it. Think of him being put in prison in Philippi. Uh, he headed for Jerusalem, even when he knew that he could face death there. But at other times he fled from cities. But then when he came to the next city, he came again, fired up, passionate, ready to preach the gospel there. Persecution is also a constant theme of the book of Revelation. So at least four of the seven churches uh, who received letters in chapters two and three were already suffering persecution or were about to. The church in Philadelphia was told, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now, the question about what that time of trial is in Revelation. David Pawson, one of the teachers who I found very helpful in the end time, suggests that actually the rapid expansion of Islam starting in the seventh century, which engulfed large parts of the Middle East, North Africa, Europe and Asia, uh, counted as that time of trial. And actually of the seven churches in uh, Revelation, the church in Philadelphia was the only one that survived the arrival of Islam in that part of the world. We're going to look at Revelation 6 more next month. I see it as a parallel passage to Matthew 24, in other words, covering the whole period from Jesus's ascension to his return. But throughout history, Christians have been killed for their faith, but the full number has not yet been reached. That's what this passage is saying. There are more to come in the final years before Jesus returns. Many of you will also recognize these verses from Revelation chapter 12, 
uh, when we're looking at Satan being cast down from heaven to earth. Now, there is quite a big debate about when this precisely happens. Is it something that's already happened? Is it something that's still to come? Uh, my personal view on this um, is that the decisive victory over Satan was won by Jesus on the cross. And that, again, this chapter talks about the whole period before, between Jesus's uh, death and resurrection and his return. Um, and that's despite the fact that it says his time is short. I'll come, come on to that in just a second. But we see at the end of Revelation 12, once he'd been kicked out of heaven, uh, the Satan uh, turns his fury against Israel, the woman, but she's taken to a safe place. And then he turns his attention to the rest of her offspring, those who hold to their testimony of Jesus. And that is the church. So once Satan is cast down to earth, he is filled with fury against both the church and against Israel. So in John 15, we saw Jesus told his followers that the world will hate them. In Revelation 12, we see that Satan hates the followers of Jesus. And actually, these two things are linked. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. How do we understand this verse? I don't think it's saying how Jesus was actually cast out of heaven. I believe that was uh, related to Jesus's death and resurrection. But it does tell us how we overcome him now that he is here on earth and filled with fury. Before the gospel, the kingdom of darkness is unchallenged in every nation. But when the gospel arrives and threatens to transform lives, Satan resists, including by persecuting believers. But there's something in the willingness of believers to lay down their lives rather than renounce their faith in Christ that undermines Satan's control over an area or a territory. Um, Edgar talked about the uh, rise of persecution. This is again from Open Doors. Every year they produce something called the World Watch uh, list, which shows the top 50 countries in the world where the persecution is most severe. And you can see in 2016, half of those countries had a level of persecution uh, described as high. Just five years later in 2021, to be in that uh, top 50 list, you had to have a level of persecution either very high or extreme, because persecution around the world is increasing so rapidly. There are another 25 countries in 2021 that had high levels of persecution, but they didn't get into the top 50. That's the rate at which persecution is uh, expanding. And we ask ourselves why it's because the gospel is going to more nations and people groups than ever before. And as it does so, Satan is resisting and, and bringing persecution of believers as a way to try and stop the spread of the church. So Jesus said, all nations will hate you because of me and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. These things happen in parallel, and both of these statements are closer to fulfillment today than they ever have been before. Okay, so now let's get on to uh, the Antichrist himself. So he's a political and military leader, culmination of human rebellion against God, and of Satan's hostility towards God and his people on earth. He will rise to power immediately before Jesus returns. He'll intensify persecution against Christians and seek to destroy the nation of Israel, but he will fail because Jesus will defeat him at his return. Some churches have a well, you might say unhealthy interest in the Antichrist, perhaps, but I think in this country, many more ignore this figure altogether. I've been a Christian for 35 years. I don't remember ever hearing live teaching on this topic. I've read books, I've watched videos, don't remember ever hearing live teaching in 35 years. But the Bible has a surprising amount to say 
about this character, even though only one generation of believers will be alive on earth when he returns. And because the Bible has so much to say about him, we should take note. So here are some passages that we will look through um, very briefly. I see them as they cross-reference each other. So one of my uh, aims today is to show you that the Bible has a completely consistent view on who this figure is, what he will be like, and what he will do. He's referred to by several names in the Bible. We're going to come across the Little Horn, the King of the North, the Man of Lawlessness, the Antichrist, and the Beast. But as we look at the passages, we'll see that they are talking about one and the same figure. So let's start in Matthew 24, verse 14 to 16, remembering again the question at the start of Matthew 24, the disciples say, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And arguably, Jesus gives two signs. The first is the preaching of the gospel uh, in the whole world is a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Roddy talked about this in September. He had told us that nations mean is ethnos, people groups. Uh, he quoted data from the Joshua Project, where it's estimated there are something over 17,400 people groups in the world of whom 7,400 are still classed as unreached, meaning that there isn't a church, among, an indigenous church amongst that people group with enough resources and people to evangelize their own people. And there's real value in looking at these data. They tell us that there's still some way to go in completing the Great Commission. But they also, if we watch them over time, show us that there's incredibly rapid progress now, faster than ever before. And we might think that in the UK, our churches have rather lost uh, a focus on the unreached and on completing the Great Commission. But globally, the church has a focus on the unreached as never before. And it's really quite plausible that if not in my lifetime, in my daughter's lifetime, that this task will be finished. But then there's a critique of this as a sign, because only God decides when adequate testimony has been given to all people groups. In fact, I would argue that only God accurately knows how many people groups there are in the world. So how do we know when the job is finished? And the answer comes in the next verse. When the job is finished, this other sign will come. I think it will come very soon after got the Lord decides that the Great Commission has been finished. And we will see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel. This will be a visible sign. Suddenly the shift of Matthew 24 goes from the whole world to Jerusalem. And there is a the leader there erecting a pagan idol in the temple. It will be very visible. It will be beamed around the world on 24 hour TV. Everybody will be able to see it and will know, yep, the end is coming. It's upon us. In terms of Romans 11, when the Great Commission is finished, it means that the full number of the Gentiles has been brought in. Now it's time for all Israel to be saved. And these are the events that will trigger that. Some people look at that passage and they say, well, maybe it doesn't really talk about the physical temple in Jerusalem. Maybe it's some sort of spiritual temple. Our, as Christians, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Maybe this is something about the church. Well, the phrase aios topos, holy place, only comes three times in the New Testament. In Matthew 24, then here in Acts 6, where it's very clear that this is talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. And similarly in Acts 21, where Paul was accused of bringing Greeks into the temple and defiling the holy place. Again, very clear that it is the temple in Jerusalem that's being talked about. And if it wasn't talking about events in the Jerusalem, the capital of the nation of Israel, these verses about 
those in Judea flee to the mountains wouldn't make any sense. They only make sense if we're actually talking about final events in the city of Jerusalem. We do have to note one implication of all of this, if this is what we understand the Bible to be saying. It means that a temple will be rebuilt before Jesus returns. Now, I believe that Revelation 11 tells us about that, and that's something that Chris talked to us about last month. So let's now look at the phrase, the abomination that causes desolation, because Jesus put, draws our attention to it. I want us to note what Jesus is saying here. He's saying if we want to understand these things, we have to study the book of Daniel. It's quite striking. Jesus says, guys, if you want to understand this, look at Daniel. It's very clear from Jesus. Uh, and when I understood that, that made a huge impact on my understanding of the events of the end times. And we'll come back to that even when we see the book of Revelation. So, Daniel was given four visions in the second half of his book. And the phrase abomination that causes desolation or something very similar appears in three of them. So in chapter seven of Daniel, he's given a vision of four beasts, which represent four empires that were to control large parts of the Middle East, including the land of Israel. So there was a lion, which is Babylon, a bear, which was Medo-Persia, a leopard, which was Alexander the Great, with four heads that stood for the four kingdoms that eventually replaced Alexander after he suddenly died. And then a mysterious fourth beast that many assume to be Rome, but we'll come to that later. And associated with this fourth beast was an arrogant little horn that grew powerful and oppressed the people of Israel until divinely removed by God. In chapter 8, Daniel has a vision of a ram, which is Medo-Persia, and a goat, which is Alexander the Great. And the goat, again, has four horns, which are the kingdoms that succeed Alexander. And out of one of these came another little horn that grew in power and captured the temple in Jerusalem. In chapter 9, Daniel prays about the end of uh, Israel's 70-year exile period in Babylon. But Daniel has shown a vision of 77s that, quote, are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And each of these sevens is understood as a period of seven years. The first 69 sevens cover the time from the rebuilding of Jerusalem after the exile to the crucifixion of Jesus and destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then the final sevens, we understand, come at the end. It says they come at the end. When someone makes a seven-year treaty, we understand that to be a seven-year treaty with Israel, but he then breaks it off halfway through and instead at the temple sets up an abomination that causes desolation. And finally, in chapters 10 and 11 of Daniel, we get a very detailed prophecy of the struggles between two of the successor kingdoms to Alexander the Great, the Seleucids, who were called the kings of the north, and the Ptolemies in Egypt, the kings of the south. And towards the end of this series of events, one of the kings of the north captures the temple in Jerusalem. He puts an end to Jewish sacrifices and instead sets up the abomination that causes desolation. Then from verse, chapter 11, verse 36 onwards in Daniel, a parallel set of events is described. And these events look very much like the events of the second century BC, but instead they will occur at the end of, at the time of the end. In other words, they are still to come. So these four visions of Daniel are a mix of both historic and future events. From history, we know that the original little horn or king of the north was a guy called Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was the eighth king of the Seleucid dynasty. He captured Jerusalem in 168 BC. He erected a pagan idol in the temple. This is the original abomination that causes desolation. But we also see a very detailed 
description of similar events at the time of the end, immediately before Jesus' return, when another king of the north will arise. And these have to be the events that Jesus points us to in Matthew 24. I'm going to move on quickly. I, if you've got a Bible, please have uh, try and find 2 Thessalonians 2 as I talk you through a few things. Um, Paul wrote this chapter to reassure the Thessalonian church because they'd heard rumours that Jesus had already returned and they feared that they'd somehow missed it. And Paul's argument in verses 3 and 4 of this passage is essentially a restatement of what uh, Jesus teaches in Matthew 24, verse 15. The final sign before Jesus's return is the appearance of this figure, whom Paul calls the man of lawlessness, who will install himself in the temple in Jerusalem. And it will be a very visible sign, such that even in first century Thessalonica, the church should soon hear about it. So if this sign hasn't happened yet, then Jesus can't have returned. So there's a real emphasis here on the visibility of this as a sign. Now, why does Paul call this guy the man of lawlessness, which is not a term we see anywhere else? Well, Daniel was told that the little horn would speak arrogantly against God and his authority. He would oppress God's holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. It appears to be a reference back to Daniel. And many of the other words and phrases in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4 are taken from the prophecies of Daniel. The descriptions of the man of lawlessness just echo the descriptions in Daniel. And the same is true of the emphasis on lies versus truth in uh, verses 10 to 12. When the little horn came, truth would be cast to the ground. Daniel was told. So as Paul teaches in 2 Thessalonians 2, he's actually drawing on two sources, Matthew 24 and the book of Daniel. Now there's a big debate on who or what is currently holding the man of lawlessness back. That's in verse uh, 6 and 7. Some people say the Holy Spirit within the church. Some people say the forces of law and order which are appointed by God. I've even heard it argued that Satan himself is holding him back. Well, my answer to this would be, who? It's God. In verse 11, it's clear that God lets this guy arise in the end. What's holding him back? It's the fact that the gospel has not yet been preached to all nations. When that happens, God will stop resisting the rise of the Antichrist and he will, he will appear. We can note that the uh, coming of the lawlessness, the lawless one in verse nine will be accompanied by all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders. That's going to point us forward to something we see in Revelation 13, uh, a bit later where we see that at the end, there'll be an unholy trinity between Satan, uh, the Antichrist, uh, and a third figure called the false prophet. And actually we say it's going to be the false prophet who will do these signs and wonders as part of this unholy trinity. Finally, I think I'd like you to note in verse 11, the rather startling truth that God remains in charge of all of these events. So I'm just... Uh, flicking to it it says for this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie we'll talk about the lie next month but it's God who sends this guy doing the false signs and wonders it's God who sends a powerful delusion to the people of the world who've rejected him and they are deceived and they lend their support on the wrong side it's like their final step of rebellion against God is to support the wrong side in the final battle. So even as we think about a scary figure coming, we, we should be encouraged that God remains in control. And this is truly good news for us. In Matthew 24, 
uh, verse 22, Jesus said, if the days of the Antichrist had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days uh, will be shortened. If we have to live through them, they'll be tough days indeed. But God will ensure that his elect will stand firm through those days. We need not fear. Praise God. In the rest of my time, I'd like to look at uh, two chapters of Revelation, uh, which contain detailed descriptions of the Antichrist. And again, too much to read here, but if you can flick through them as I'm talking, that'd be great, and I encourage you to read them afterwards. The first thing to note is that these chapters contain lots of references to Daniel. So just again, we have this picture. There are the same bits of scripture which are showing us what this figure is going to be like. So right at the start, we see references to a beast with multiple heads and horns. The wording of uh, chapter 13 verses 5 to 7, again, lots of references to the prophecies in Daniel in how they describe this figure who will arise. In chapter 13, verse 1 to 2, it says, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. So we see three of the beasts that Daniel was shown in chapter seven mentioned here. Uh, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, but they're in reverse order. And the one that is highlighted, it looked like a leopard. And I'll come back to this later, but note that, that the leopard was Alexander the Great, the four wings were the kingdoms that came after him. It was from one of those kingdoms that the uh, Antiochus Epiphanes arose to uh, set up the abomination that causes desolation in the temple. Now, if we read chapter 13 and chapter 17, we might get a bit confused. Is it really talking about empires or is it talking about kings? 13 seems to talk more about empires. 17 describes the same beast, but then is talking about kings. And my explanation for that is if we look at history and think about the persecution of God's people, think I'm thinking particularly here in the Old Testament, it's the combination of a powerful empire and a hostile ruler that is disastrous for God's people. So when the Israelites went down into Egypt, initially they were welcomed by the first Pharaoh. But sometime later, there arose another Pharaoh who didn't remember Joseph, and he put the people into slavery. If we think about the Medo-Persian Empire, when that came up, the first thing that King Cyrus did was to say to the people of Israel, you can go home now and you can rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. He's called God's shepherd. He didn't acknowledge God, but he's a good guy in the history of Israel. But sometime later in the Medo-Persian Empire, under another king, one of the high officials, Haman, plotted to try and eradicate all the people of Israel. And it was only the intervention of Queen Esther and the other events surrounding that that actually prevented them from being wiped out under the Medo-Persian Empire. So a combination, not, it's not just the empire itself, but the empire under a ruler who is hostile. Now, this reference to previous empires points to a, a sort of repeated pattern like things we've seen before. And in 1 John, where we hear about the Antichrist, uh, John makes the same, uh, same point. In chapter 2, verse 18 of 1 John, he says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, Many antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. There is a pattern, but they will reach a climax under this guy. And in chapter four, John talks of the spirit of the antichrist, which has been promote, provoking people to deny the truth about Jesus and to persecute his followers ever since Jesus's first coming. 
There have therefore been many people who've manifested antichrist characteristics. In our day, we might think of Hitler as a rather clear example, but there's still at least one figure, the antichrist, who is still to come. Revelation 17 verse 10 tells us a little bit more about this repeated pattern, and it describes the Antichrist as being in a line of eight kings. But remember, I think we're talking about powerful end, end empires headed by rulers who are hostile to God and to his people. So who are the other seven? Well, obviously, there's lots of debate about that. Some people have tried to uh, thinking that this was really referring to the, the Roman era where when John was writing, they've tried to look for a possible string of seven uh, Roman emperors, but I don't think that really works. And um, somebody called Joel Richardson, who I will uh, mention a little bit later, uh, says, no, well, let's look at hostile em empires. And he says, five have fallen. And the obvious ones there are Egypt, who we've mentioned, who put the Israelites into slavery. Assyria, who took the, Egypt, the northern tribes into uh, exile, mainly never to return. The Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and Alexander the Great with the Seleucids, who we've talked a lot about. That then brings us to one is, and that does seem a very plausible reference to Rome at the time that John was writing. Many argue that the famous number 666, the mark of the beast at the end of Revelation 13 is a reference to Nero Caesar. But then we get the other who's not yet come, but when he does come, he will remain for only a little while. I should say only is not in the Greek there. He will remain for a little while. The li a little while is the same word as his time is short in Revelation 12. So if we think Revelation 12 relates to quite a long period, actually this could be quite a long period. Who might this be? This is a chart from Patrick Johnson who set up Operation World. Please don't try and get your head around all the details, but just look at the chart at the top. It's major empires in the world since Jesus's time. So along the horizontal axis, we've got the dates, and up the side, there's some sort of measure of how much power and influence these empires wielded. And the main thing I want you to look at, just look at the, the green, which dominates a long period of that time. So after the Roman Empire, what was the really next big empire that exercised uh, influence over a large part of the world? It was the succession of Islamic caliphates soon after Muhammad, which really, uh, were dominant until the West started uh, industrialization and modernization and gradually took over. There's a brilliant book by a guy called David Garrison called A Wind in the House of Islam. Uh, and he looks at the voluntary movements of people from a Muslim background to Christ, and they're happening in our day as never before. But the striking thing in his historical review, in the first 1,250 years after the rise of Islam, when Islam conquered many previously Christian lands and wiped out the church there, there wasn't a single recorded voluntary move of people from an Islamic background to Christ. 1,250 years. If it is the big frightening beast, there's been nothing like it in history. So, the vision is of a beast with seven heads, but the beast uh, is actually an eighth king who belongs to the previous seven. And there's various references in Revelation to him being who he once was, now is not, and yet will come. In chapter 17, that phrase comes in verse 8 and verse 17, suggesting a return of one of the previous seven empires or kings. In chapter 11 and in chapter 17, it also says he will come up out of the abyss. 
And in Greek mythology, this was a place where fallen angels and particularly evil kings were held. So if he comes up out of the abyss again, this is suggesting he is in some way a new uh, manifestation of one of the previous uh, Antichrist empires and kings. Some have suggested a return of the Roman Empire, perhaps with some sort of morphing of the U European Union. But actually, I find it much more plausible we, we should expect a return of the Seventh Empire. In other words, another Islamic caliphate headed by a ruler who will hate God's people, both Christians and Jews. Uh, remember that in Daniel, the Antichrist is called the King of the North, like Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Um, Antiochus had his capital at Antioch in modern day Turkey, near the border with Syria. By contrast, Rome would be the king of the West, not the king of the North. And I'll just uh, we'll pick this up in questions. I'm really struck by the fact that Antiochus had his capital in Turkey. The final Islamic caliphate was the Turkish Ottoman Empire, which ended in 1924. The book of Revelation was originally written to seven churches in what is today Turkey. Are we seeing some hints there as to the origins of this guy who will come? The Antichrist will persecute both Christians and Jews. Uh, in chapter 11, we see him uh, capturing uh, Jerusalem, he has to do that to kill the two prophets who've been testifying there. In chapter 13, it says uh, it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. Uh, that is, uh, again, a reference back to Daniel. In Matthew 24, verses 15 to 21, we see the terrible persecution that will come on the people of Jerusalem and Judea when the Antichrist arises. We also have persecution of the church. In 13 verse 7b, it was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. And verses 15 to 18 describe the terrible persecution of all of God's people, Christians um, around the world under the Antichrist. We can discuss the mark of the beast in questions, but would I say already around the world where there's persecution many christians are already marginalized in labor and other markets as part of their uh, daily persecution and of course we know that china is developing uh, internet surveillance technology uh, which means that the state can start discriminating against people on the basis of their religious affiliation now, also the reference to 42 months in 13 verse 5, this is the period for which the Antichrist will exercise his authority. It's the same as the half of seven in Daniel 9. It also elsewhere in Revelation is described as 1,260 days or a time, times and half a time, where that's three and a half years. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, know that there are only three and a half years left until Jesus returns. It really is the final sign. And Jesus tells us that this period has to be short because of the intensity of suffering for the people of Israel and the persecution of the church. Lots of people think the Antichrist will head up some sort of one world government because of statements like it was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation and all inhabitants of the world will worship the beast. Uh, and they say, well, this can only be established through a one world government. Like, there's some a narrative of a reversal of the Tower of Babel story, where the inhabitants of the earth finally overcome all their linguistic and ethnic divisions so as to unite against God and his people. But if we look in 2 Timothy 3, it describes what people are going to be like in the end times. I really don't see that's going to happen. There'll be as selfish, greedy, angry with each other as ever and prone to conflict. Daniel was told in chapter nine, verse 26, war will continue to the end. In Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 43, we get a detailed account of some of the countries that the Antichrist will and will not conquer. And in Revelation 13, verse 4, people say, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? It's not that everyone's united, 
there's a possibility of waging war. Daniel 11.44, this figure has been down to Egypt and he comes back, reports from the east and the north alarm him and he turns back and goes back up to Israel. And some say, well, maybe it's possible that neither China, the east, nor Russia, the north, will back him. He won't have uh, unopposed authority. Undoubtedly, he will rise rapidly to become a powerful figure on the global stage, but not necessarily unchallenged. However, if he is the leader of a restored Islamic caliphate, then it is plausible that he will have committed supporters in every people, tribe, language and nation. Quite a lot of what I've said uh, about in the last bit about the identity of the Antichrist, um, I have found really helpful reading two books by, this, by Joel Richardson, um, which you can get hold of uh, via the web. I just want to acknowledge his source. I find his writing very, very clear. In Islamic Antichrist, he makes a very interesting look at Islamic eschatology, where there are three characters. There is a political military leader called the Mahdi, who will uh, mobilize an army to come and attack Israel, coming down from the north. In Islamic eschatology, Jesus will return and will side with the Mahdi against Israel. But there will be another character called Al-Dajjal, the false Jesus, who will defend Jerusalem. I think that's quite widespread across various branches of Islam, that sort of expectation. But as we look at it, we might, we would think actually, yes, there will be three figures, but the, he's got the names wrong. The Mahdi looks very much like our Antichrist. The one they think is Jesus looks remarkably like our false prophet. And remember, Jesus said at the end, false messiahs will come claiming to be Jesus. And then Jesus looks much more like this figure, the Al Dajjal. Finally, just to say, as this force comes to attack Israel and Jerusalem, this is the time when the people of Israel, as I understand it anyway, call out to Jesus. Uh, and he returns. They'll have had the three and a half years of witnessing of the witnesses in Revelation 11. They will cry out to God for saving. Jesus will return. They will look on the one they have pierced when they see him return, but he will return as their savior and there will be great turning to him and then all Israel will be saved. So the gospel will have gone to all nations, but also in these terrible events we're describing, all Israel will also be saved. Praise God. I'm aware there is no flame official line on all of these events, so I should just do a disclaimer that this is my understanding of these things. Um, it's not necessarily flame's line, uh, but let's have questions and see what people think. Yeah, thanks, Colin. I'm, I, I want to call it a day there. Colin, I think you've just helped us. Uh, it certainly helped me uh, with a, it's very clear what you've been talking about. Of course, there will be different views, and we would say in Flame, we don't impose any views on anybody because it's such a controversial subject, and it's also one that um, is open to scriptural um, interpretation. So we do not have a policy, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a doctrine on this. Um, I have certain views and I think others in flame do, but that's okay. What we wanted to do was see some of the scriptures that you brought, you've made it really clear. And, and, I'm, and I want to thank you. And I'm really looking forward uh, to, the, to the, what we've got in, in, on the 10th of December. And um, uh, just remind me, what is it you're speaking on on the 10th, Colin? I call in them birth pains. Oh, uh, that's right. Birth pains. Earlier in Matthew 24, but yeah. seeing how that builds to the end. Yes, thank you. What I'd like to do, having thanked you, is to pray for all of us as we go. Is that all right? So I want to pray in the name of Jesus that any, if there has been any fear, we are all redeemed 
by the blood of the lamb and we do not need to fear because our lives are in the hands of the living God. And Lord, as we go away, I pray this morning for the peace of the Lord that passes all understanding to come into our, our spirits, our souls, our bodies. And Lord, I pray that we have had um, greater revelation, that we will start to look more and more into the scriptures. And you might disagree with Colin, but Jesus, it's I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would show each of us what you want us to understand in order that we can be ready to stand firm at the end. And Lord, I just commit this week, this day into your hands. And I just ask that you would uh, minister to each of us and help us to get greater revelation on your return, which I think is so exciting. I have a passion for the return of Jesus. And we say today, Lord, Maranatha. Amen.